But, uh, we're first going to hear from Joel Rogers, who's the director of the Center on Wisconsin Strategies, CALS. Uh, he has uh, written many books, and he has one of those distinguished MacArthur Genius Awards and was named by Newsweek as one of the 100 living Americans most likely to shape U.S. politics and culture in the 21st century. So can you live up to that, Joel? No, I can't. Okay. No, I can't. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I do uh, direct cows. It's just called cows, by the way, Jonathan, not Center on Wisconsin Strategy, which is its old name, much less Center on Wisconsin Strategies, which is a common uh, failure. Uh, we used to have the name Center on Wisconsin Strategy in order to produce the acronym COWS uh, here in America's Dairyland, but most of our work now is outside of Wisconsin. We're all over the place. I'll tell you about COWS in a second. But very little uh, presence in Wisconsin given the present government here. Uh, anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about COWS and SSTI, uh, which is sort of the reason I'm here. COWS is a think and do tank and a UW center, which is a term of art that you've survived successfully in administrative gauntlet of review saying that you know, uh, sir, uh, you know uh, establishing that you're doing something useful, compatible with university goals, et cetera, that's not being done by anyone else. And what we do is we research and then to some degree develop through TA and, and other sorts of more hands-on assistance, high road solutions to a, a range of social problems. You get a program description here. I'll give my slides to someone if everyone, anybody wants to look at it. And we do some international work but, and some national U.S. policy work, but most of our focus is on subnational, on states and, uh, and cities, uh, which we understand as metros, not just the core city or the inner city or the jurisdiction of the city, but the metropolitan area in which the city sits and typically anchors. And we work in an unusually wide range of areas which may make us sound like a mile wide and only an inch deep. We think of it as just testifying to the fact we punch well above our weight. <laughs> we work in education and training. We work in land use and planning, uh, regional economic development, government revenue, budgeting, and performance, a bunch of stuff in energy efficiency and renewable generation, a bunch of stuff in infrastructure, uh, water infrastructure is a growing concern, green water infrastructure. Uh, and we do a bunch of stuff in transportation. And then along with that, we do, uh, we run a couple of sort of executive-led state and local executives, uh, uh, typically, you know, governors, secretaries of different cabinet agencies, mayors, people like that. That's what I mean by state, state and local executives. And we do one with mayors, that's called the Mayor's Innovation Project, and one with secretaries of transportation. Again, not including Wisconsin, since again, it's, it's useful, and the government here is opposed to that at present. But it includes 18 states. Uh, it's called the State Smart Transportation Initiative. And what it does, it's got uh, CEOs, that is secretaries of transportation, and their top staff. They get together regularly. They, uh, they amount, amount to a certain community of practice or COP. And what we do is we, uh, we have discussions with them about evolving and emerging and to be supported best practices or emerging practices in, in the high road uh, that we favor. Uh, we provide a bunch of technical assistance to them. We do some research as well. And then we're sort of a public resource in general for the trans broader transportation community. Uh, uh, I mentioned high road a couple times. Let me just try to define that briefly. Jonathan, how much time do we have? Do we have 20 minutes apiece or 15? Or? 15 minutes. 15, so I'm almost out of time. So it was good talking to all of you and whatever. <laughs> anyway, high road refers to uh, a, a scalable, uh, universally available, I think, and scalable place-based strategy or set of strategies to reconcile the not uncommon values of shared prosperity, that is high and rising living standards, uh, equal opportunity, equal chance to avail yourself of the fruits of your labor, et cetera, shared prosperity, uh, uh, sustainability, that is living in a way that doesn't compromise the uh, capabilities of life in future generations, and then efficient democracy, meaning satisfying normative, Gettysburg sort of normative demands of other people, by the people, for the people, etc., but also being allocatively and dynamically uh, efficient. And doing all those things, which are commonly seen as irreconcilable values or a terrible tension with one another, we're showing how they're in fact necessary ingredients of one another, necessary supports for one another, and how you can actually reconcile them and do so all under competitive market conditions. Nice work if you can get it. We think it's actually fairly easy to get if you've got the political will to get it. And the strategy is basically to use the tools of democracy, public policy, 
advocacy, outside pressure, inside outside games, et cetera, but in the state and out and in the civil society, they're very proudly to add value, uh, that is to increase productivity, understood as value per unit of input, to reduce waste uh, in everything, basically in people and machines and the environment, and to capture and share the benefits of doing that locally, both locally. Uh, and then to repeat and extend and try to learn from what you've done. Uh, or if you prefer Beckett, you know, I sort of do, you know, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. That's what we're about. This sort of, uh, this uh, four-step dance of add value, reduce waste, capture and share, and then repeat. Okay, that's what High Road is about. And that implies different things for firms. But it, for, it, it implies basically that you shouldn't compete on price alone. Uh, you should compete on some measure of uh, productivity or quality as distinctiveness and, uh, uh, and performance. Uh, and, and that requires that you do a number of things as a firm, uh, that you respect your workers a little bit more, that you get them the best equipment, that you do this and that and a variety of other things. But also for communities, it implies a choice to actually try to close off the alternative uh, path of development, familiar to all of you, which is basically to you know, uh, treat people like a roadkill and the earth like a sewer and uh, establish public authority as something to make fun of and starve and then try to extract as many rents from as possible. Call that the low road. The high road is sort of its opposite. And the choice for communities is to try to close off that low road, help pave the high road, and connect workers and firms stuck on one to try to be able to mo uh, you know, roll merrily along the second. But uh, this gets us into transportation relatively quickly because it also implies a choice of, uh, in communities of trying to connect people and firms to one another and to exploit the, the economies of, of, of scope as well as scale that are available in communities, the wealth of networks that's available in communities, et cetera. It departs from a pretty established uh, insight from economic development theory that as you move from poverty to wealth, you're also in general moving both for individuals and firms from isolation to some sort of connection or networking. And so the high road path or going on the high road path is basically one which moves from exclusion to inclusion, from neglect to care, from divestment to stewardship uh, and investment. Anyway, uh, be assured if your manager is out there, you can measure these things for establishments and firms. You can measure it in these sorts of ways. This is what we typically recommend to governors that we deal with. And as a scan that you go or a score thing that you can put in your economic development subsidies, you can also measure it for communities. For the communities, it's in some ways easier. You just look at their relative, their health, their wealth, their wages, their savings, their educational attainment, you know, a variety of other typical measures. It's not that hard to tell a high road firm from a low road firm or a high road community from a low road community. Let, let me give you an example. I'll show you two, two animals. They're virtually identical, but if you can tell them apart, you can tell a high road apart from low road. Can you? Okay, fine, well enough. All right, now let's get into our topic finally. Uh, one minute uh, left here. Transportation, health, and cities. Well, let's start with health. Health is really important. <laughs> you know, our lives depend on it, ha, ha, ha. We have a very inefficient healthcare system in the US. We are a relatively unhealthy country given our level of alleged development. Of course, Oscar Wilde, uh, you know, the famous Irish poet, savant, playwright, et cetera, said, Finally, famously observed, America is the only country on earth that went directly from barbarism to decadence without pausing for civilization. And, and we have not really paused for civilization in the U.S. We are still really an outlier. The ACA will partially re repair that, but not entirely. Traffic, of course, transportation is very, very important in health. You know, here it kills, what is it? still upwards of 30,000 people a year. Worldwide, it kills through emissions and other things more people than it kills in actual accidents. So transportation is a source of a lot, a lot of bad health as well as a lot of good wealth that we have in the world. Uh, and uh, transportation uses a big chunk of our energy. Uh, and we are very dependent, as the stuff on the left in terms of sources shows you, look how small solar is and uh, hydro has been around forever. You got a little biomass, you know, ethanol subsidies, et cetera. But basically, we're very dependent on fossil fuels. And a, ch a huge chunk of those fossil fuels go to transportation, largely the petroleum stuff, of course. We also waste a lot of energy here, as we do in health, but leave that aside. Tra transportation uses a ton of fuel. Uh, uh, fossil fuel, that's burned, and that's probably, in general, bad for your health. Certainly individual health and health of the climate as well. Transportation is also, though, a very big ticket item, uh, not just in the country, where we spend about uh, $1.4 trillion on it, uh, only 3% of which, by the way, is provided by the federal government. The rest of it is provided by state and local governments, and then the rest of us trying to navigate the built environment that they basically create. 
It was also a big ticket item in individual households. So I pulled some numbers for you for the Madison MSA. Residents spend in the whole MSA about 3.8 billion annually on transportation costs. So 1.8 billion in Madison alone. There's a breakdown for individual communities. So over say, you know, a standard generation, say 30 years, we use that. It's about $100 billion and $33 billion uh, respectively. That's a fair amount of change. If you do that well, you can also monetize that, borrow on that, do that in different ways. And also transportation, talk about connection, is connected with housing and, and sprawl in a way that I think people, environmentalists typically and transportation people typically don't really connect which, with a major equity point. So if you're looking to build an alliance between people concerned about the environment and people concerned about simply making a living and surviving, you know, the equity concern that we hear about increasingly, uh, look at a typical household and what it spends its money on. You'll see that housing and transportation are the really, really big ticket items followed closely by utilities. That's largely energy, but increasingly communications as well, and then healthcare. But among poor, and we know about the tremendous diseconomies in our transportation system. Here's a stylized traffic jam, and here's the number of people in it. Ha, ha, ha. But there's also a very close connection between transportation and, and housing. Namely, you, if you're poor, especially, you have to drive till you qualify. And as you get to the point of maybe 15 miles out of the urban center, transportation costs for average families in the $20,000 to $50,000 range in our metro areas actually exceed housing costs. So if you get the transportation stuff fixed better to permit the housing to be closer in and work that out, you can make great gains both for the environment uh, and for equity. It's always worth keeping in mind, I think. And finally, we're talking about cities. Why are we talking about cities? Because that's where most people live. That's where an even larger share of our national product is produced. And that's, that's certainly true in the US. Here's the top 100 metro areas in the US. And that's only 12% of our continental size land mass, but it's at least 75%, I think is the low estimate, of GDP, 65% of the population. It's, and virtually all the, the research, the innovation, the immigrants, variety of other useful things to have around. And what is true of the US is true of the world. We're often told that the world is sort of this flat, you know, glistening surface in which, you know, wages increase one place, you know, it's, everything is going to go to Bangalore or whatever. Call that the, uh, you know, the, the Thomas Friedman view of the world. The world is flat. But the world, in fact, is not flat. It's more spiky. Here's, here's the actual product in the world, and you'll see that it's very much punctuated spatially by different cities. And that's true, that's going to be true in the future as well. Cities are basically the future. Here's a projection of world growth in the next 25 years or so, and you see that about 70% of that's going to come in cities. So cities are the future. And that's also the case in, pop, in terms of population. It's not as if people are going to migrate out of cities, rather they're migrating into cities. So we see it all, all over. So in terms of improving the world, now we're finally getting to what I wanted to talk about. Uh, basically what you got to do is get smart and unapologetic about cities, which means uh, reject the iron law of urban decay that we learned in infancy, which projected that even successful cities were doomed to failure because as incomes arose, people moved out to the suburbs, and then uh, revenue is in the cities decline, and then the public goods in the city would deteriorate, leading more people to flee the cities. You know, imagine, say, elementary schools as sort of the snail darter of the urban ecosystem. When they go, you know, anybody with any money gets out as fast as they can. The middle class flees, the city collapses into you know, ruinous poverty with uh, punctuated by, you know, sky high, uh, you know, I don't know, up, uh, sky level uh, apartment houses of great wealth or whatever. And then poverty concentrates and things spiral down from there. But in fact, cities contain a huge number of obvious assets and basically being smart about cities means take advantage of those assets. And those are location, their density, their key infrastructure, a variety of other things. If you try to do that, working out of cities, you'll have enormous amount of leverage at your disposal because cities do have a huge amount of leverage in the U.S. Just the top ten cities are bigger than the combined uh, uh, GDP of all these different states, about 45 different states there. Indeed, those top ten cities are bigger than these economies. Uh, but, okay, leaving aside the power, cities are also, on, on balance, much greener than the rest of the country. That's where and they provide examples of how you should live. Here are two views of Chicago, uh, and, and red means bad in terms of climate, and blue means wonderful in terms of climate. On, a, on, a, on an acreage basis, Chicago looks like you know, a hellhole, you know, very low Dante's uh, registry of, uh, of degradation. Uh, looked at on a per capita basis, Chicago is you know, this halcyon place, and it's the, it's the suburbs that should be sent to hell. Or you could do the same sort of picture for any number of metro areas in the US, 
here is, uh, here's New York and Philadelphia, we could do it. Uh, we also know that density will tend to decrease VMT. That seems to be a, a regularity as great as more, better, more private as the regularity of human nature. We also know that cities, again, are much more productive than elsewhere. That's the population, or uh, that's the GDP, that's the population, knows that they always work below them. Those are also easier to organize, just to take one example. About half the labor movement is only in, in about 25 different metro areas. And not irrelevant, they're also more progressive. Uh, you, you find the midpoint, or the, the, the point at which people become Democrats or Republicans at around 800 person per square mile. And that's a finding that holds, <laughs> seriously, seriously. And that holds in red states as well as blue states. Uh, now, as you think about transportation in cities, here's roughly the way which you should think about it. You know, think about the system, and then uh, think about the, the, uh, you know, the cost and benefits of different interventions. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind your regional economic development stuff and livability. But what you should basically aim for throughout is to take advantage of the potential location efficiency of cities. And by that, I mean simply a way of defining and measuring local convenience and regional accessibility. Uh, in, in, in terms that un engineers might be able to understand. Uh, so you can think of it as an urban or place-based equivalent of thermal or energy efficiency for buildings or, or, and equipment. Or you can think of it, you know, if you're a manager, think of it as a system of, of setting performance goals for community plans intended to meet the triple bottom line of economy, environment, community benefits, or what I'd call high road. And what that means basically in cities is to look at the mobility modes by energy efficiency and try to select for the first and against the second. You try to make cities more walkable, bikeable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you try to discourage a lot of car traffic inside the city. And then you also try to have, you want to make connections to the city as energy efficient as you can. What that reduces to in turn is something called transit-oriented development. I'm almost done, I promise you, Jonathan. Uh, which means, again, okay. location efficiency. What? Okay. I'm okay. I'm not okay. I'm, I'm dying here. I'm dying. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you want a location efficiency. You want a rich... I always do this. I always make too many slides and then talk too fast. It's, it's a nightmare. It's hard to be Joel. Anyway, rich mix of cities. <laughs> then you want to do value capture. You can, in fact, pay for all this stuff. And the same way you can pay for you know, retrofitting buildings. You simply borrow off all the money that you're saving in the future. Uh, uh, you do value capture in different ways. You do place making, places for people. You want to enrich the existing qualities, provide new connections. Again, drive toward connections, 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 and resolve the tension altogether between nodes or places. You can have a subway station or a train station or an intermodal station, or whatever, and you can build a bunch of stuff around that, and then you can do mixed use stuff, and you produce a lot of value, and you know, it's all a beautiful thing. But you also want to connect the cities to other stuff in, in cargo-oriented development, which is just the way that you get the stuff into and out of the city appropriately. And there you basically want to worry about your, your first and last mile. Here, uh, electrification is going to help a huge amount. It already is in different ways, as will, for that matter, you know, stuff that Jim may talk about, you know, with autonomous and connected vehicles and other sorts of cool things. But you want to intensify the use of land adjacent to major transportation terminals. You know, think your rail yards, your seaports, your inland ports, your airports, et cetera, all of which are largely undeveloped uh, in most portions of the U.S. And then intentionally you want to improve local connectivity through better intermodal stuff, thereby, you know, developing markets and, and market share. Uh, and that all will have the effect of creating and capturing improved economic value locally. Uh, but basically, you know, we know how to do this stuff. You can build cities around cars and traffic, which is what we've done for a long time, and what you get is uh, cars and traffic. Uh, boom, boom. Or you can build, uh, there's more, or yeah, there's more, uh, and there's sprawl, okay. Or you can build cities around people, and what you get is, surprisingly, uh, people. And there they are, they're talking to each other, they're not at war with each other, they may be carrying concealed handguns, about to shoot each other, but they appear at least, <laughs> but they appear at least to be reasonably you know, uh, getting along okay. And the great opportunity that we have in cities and their surrounding metro areas is we have a chance basically to rebuild the American footprint in the last, in the next 15 years or so. I, I, but here's uh, Nelson's estimates. I think these should all be delayed about five years given the, the housing crash that we're just now beginning to recover from. But here is a, here's the American footprint of the built environment in 2000. And here it is in uh, 2030, I think more like 2035. Notice it's about, a, you know, one, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, what, 125% bigger, okay? Not 125% bigger, it's 125 billion feet bigger. 
But those 125 billion feet are basically going to be new feet. They're going to be either entirely new construction or they're going to be substantially retrofitted construction, meaning that within our lifetimes, I hope you all live at least till 2030, if not 2035, about half of the built environment uh, of the U.S. at that point is going to be what we do between now and then. That's the opportunity. That's a huge opportunity for health, wealth, nice cities, good transportation, etc. I got some other slides, but I will spare you them. <laughs>